Hello everyone, welcome to The Weeb Initiative, I'm your host The Weeb. This is the show where every other week I'll be talking about anime, manga and everything in between. And this week I'll be talking about Trinity 7 as the continuation to the series I'm making right now. The the, the trend of itchy harem stuff that came out in the mid to late 2010s and with not much further ado, let's start. So first off, spoiler alert, as always, I'll be talking about all the first season of the anime, the only season of the anime that it actually has. I will not be talking about the OVAs, not the manga, and not the movies, just the, the anime. So first off, the stats. Trinity 7 is originally a manga written by Saito Kenji and illustrated by Akinari Nao. It started the run on December 2010 and is still going. It has 29 volumes as of today. I think this is right, I don't actually know. I think it's around the 130 chapters as the time of recording. The um, anime came out in October 2014 to December 2014 with 12 episodes plus the OVA. It came out six months before the third season of High School DxD. So right in the middle of the run, let's say. And so it had also it has a light novel which started in December 2014 and still going as the manga. And two anime films, one released in February 2017 and the second one in March 2019. So, let's just start with the story. So, what is Trinity 7 about and why do I think it, it is with, uh, it goes with High School DxD in this uh, trend of the 2010s. So, mind you, I will not be pointing it out, but you can kind of see. It. So, Trinity 7 is a shonen uh, way more focused on action and story, but still, the main protagonist is Kasuga Arata, who's a normal schoolboy. The whole set, uh, school setting at the start. He's a pervert, and he lives with his cousin. I don't actually remember her name, uh, Hijiri. And for one reason or another, a huge, like, uh, earth-shattering phenomenon happened one day, and Hijiri gives Arata a little book and then the this earth-shattering event basically erases all the people they uh, they are close to and erases basically everyone around them and everything around them and he did too but Arata for one reason or another is saved and so the first episode Arata basically uh, gets this introduction with Hijiri and everything else but in the middle of it, he discovers actually that he is living in an alternate world outside of the our normal reality. Basically, basically a pocket dimension, more or less. And he discovers that actually the Hijiri he's seeing is not actually Hijiri, but is the Grimoire or the little book that he received from her. And so Arata is rescued by our main heroine. Or the first, um, the first one of the the heron that eventually forms, that we get to meet, that is Asami Lilith, who um, that basically saves Arata from this um, pocket dimension and so starts the whole story. So Arata chooses after knowing that he was locked into this pocket dimension that he actually uh, vanished in that earth-shattering event that he will become a mage because apparently this whole thing was started by magic and to control magic you have to become a mage and so he embarks on this whole adventure about entering a magic school 
more like a normal Japanese school, but with magic stuff and a whole stylistic difference. So it's not the normal stuff, but the setting is the same. That, that's what I mean. And so from this point on, um, Arata is uh, is trying to study to recover, to rescue uh, Hijiri, to find Hijiri again. And that's basically the first episode setup of the whole thing. So now to the introduction of the, the characters, because the, the characters are the one thing that the first season actually does, right? So the first season actually doesn't have a lot of story, if you really think about it, because for the most of it, it's just a setup for some things that will happen later. And for one different from High School DxD where the story takes second second seat to the amount of fan service that is, the amount of H, the amount of boobs that appear. Trinity 7 actually is for one, it's censored, so nothing ever appears and we have most of the time the when the when the girls get their clothes exploded for the most of it, scraps of the uh, rags of the clothing will cover their nipples and the private parts or depending on the scene, maybe the character will get um, things hidden or we get also the some t- uh, the one that we see sometimes, the clever use of uh, god rays or lighting covering the, the aforementioned parts. So... It has a really different tone from High School DxD on that on that front, and also the whole thing has a whole lot of differences in not only the the amount of story and plot that is given, but also the differences in animation and also the how much the story works and the pacing and the structure. So I didn't actually talk about this before but the studio responsible for the anime is seven arc productions they are not new but a fairly at this point like kind of old studio so they have um, some anime on their resume such as uh, maho shoujo lyrica nanoha but aside from that, not many that are, let's say, notable. Maybe Dog Days, but still, that that's debatable. And so they did the, not only Train 7, but also the OVA and the movies. That being said, uh, I will talk more about the animation later, but um, the animation is inconsistent at, at best. So, why is... Why is it called Train 7? So what is the story really about? Because I, I just talked about the, f- the first episode. So as Arata starts studying in the school, he eventually gets the, the ropes for how to actually do magic. And while the anime doesn't actually explain it much, I don't actually think the, the manga does a really good job either. The the thing is the explanations are really thrown together and inconsistent. So for instance, you can never really tell if what the the person is doing is a macro, a spell, a spell macro, uh, incantation, whatever. What happens a lot is that the magic is there just to create a, a bit of tension in the story. The action scenes are not really animated in um let's say. They don't actually trade a lot of punches at um, one another. And even when there is physical attacks involved, the animation is pretty still. I'm getting uh, outside of the um, what I'm ta- trying to talk at. The animation is, comes comes later. So back to it. The um, So the story. So Arata gets the ropes of what magic does and whatever. And so he gets gets to meet first the Lilith. Lilith is... A teacher inside the the, um, Biblia Academy and he gets to meet the headmaster 
Biblia headmaster. I don't actually remember if they they mentioned his first name, but whatever. He gets to meet so so Lilith saves him and is a teacher, but she's the same age as Arata. And from from the get go, you can get, get to see that she's the main wife, let's say. And so we get to meet the other Trinity Seven. So Trinity Seven is the um, a title that comes to mages inside the school that have mastered the archives. So there is this whole, and they eventually expand this inside the manga, but basically every every mage has a theme of research that they research for their whole life. So the, um, the theme can be anything, but all the themes are contained inside archives. Archives are based Basically, they are the um, I don't know a codex of I, I don't actually a lexicon of all the things that can be ever studied, and they are divided inside of seven archives, and each of the archives are based on the seven deadly sims. So from pride, um, from pride to gluttony, and so on and so forth. And each of the 27, that is the seven people that actually mastered their whole research, is still being students. They are super talented and mages and whatever, and they all, they are all girls because they really throw together a really bad reason for it. But because apparently, um, to do magic, you need to have emotion, um, put emotions into it, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, Girls are better to express this. It doesn't really <laughs> explain nothing, but it's just an explanation of why the 27 are girls. That being said, so we get to meet all the 27. All the 27 comes um, in the running of the anime because um, we get to meet Levi and Selena at the beginning. Although Selena is not the 27, I get to that because she is uh, actually somewhat of a center point of a later arc of uh, the beginning. But so the first 27s that uh, Arata gets to meet is Selena, Levi, Lilith, Arin, Akio, and Mira. So this first um, five, because the later two become, let's say, the, the center point of the later arc. So from this point on, uh, for the first half of the season it's basically uh, get to know each of the the first girls and whatever and later on towards the fifth to s- uh, fifth sixth and I uh, may- maybe seventh episode uh, we get the first uh, let's say major uh, arc of the um, whole thing where actually we get to meet one of the 27 that's missing and the other part of Selena that Actually, Selena is not a 27, but her twin, um, big sister, is so, and she's missing. And basically, what comes out is that Selena actually has a twin sister that is Lizzie, that is the 27 of Asedia, which translates to sloth, I think it, it's how you call it in, in English. And the other thing, right, so one of the quirks they tell is that the theme, the archive you're related to, is the furthest from you, so whenever you see someone from, let's say, sloth, they are hyperactive or they are impatient and whatever, and so on and so forth. So each of the girls have their um, quirks and their theme their theme of research is the opposite of it. So, for instance, Arin is the from the Ida archive, the archive of Wrath, but she's emotionless and so on and so forth. And this whole thing builds up into uh, every one of the girls in the harem is a bit different, which helps in the harem factor. I don't actually remember when I talked first about it, but still, that, that's not the point. The thing is, Back to the story. So, Lizzie 
actually comes out to be a um, evil mage that she's trying to uh, get all powerful for her own reasons and further her s research and whatever. And one of her objectives is actually taking the magic from all the 27 to to get more powerful and whatever. And so we get this whole uh, arc where they try to save Lizzie, but Lizzie then does use her last crest. The last crest is basically the swan song from Symphon Girdem. They, it's like the ultimate spell that will kill you, but will have some, something like a really uh, powerful effect and whatever. And Lizzie gets stuck in a faster than light time, let's say. So she cannot uh, disaccelerate. How can I say that? She becomes so fast towards the uh, speed of light that she's stuck in this motion of being faster than light and thus everything around her basically stops. So she roams around the world and whatever, around the dimensions, with the time stopped for her. And so she cannot, and she cannot uh, like stop her own speed, so she's basically stuck. So, um, this is the first arc, the, then Arata swears that she, he will save her and she eventually falls in love with him. It's, I mean, it's point in time, I, I'm just uh, explaining the plot really quickly because at this point, a pervert of a main protagonist, uh, a harem, the main heroine is a redhead with big boobies and you know, she has the name Lilith, and after, the, let's say, the, I don't actually know what the, the movies cover, but the, just as a spoiler, the manga tells us that she's the daughter of the Demon Lord, which, uh, you know, it hits too close, right? Hits too close to home. And so the f first arc that we encounter is this, and the second arc then is to actually present the, the last train 7 that we don't actually know to that point is Yui, who's the um, train 7 of Avaricia or Avarice and basically the the plot is that um, due to Arata's influence because Arata comes out to be a Demon Lord candidate they don't actually uh, explain this well in the anime, they explain it way later like in the last episode to justify some things that happen, but Arata is the Demon Lord candidate and so he has a whole lot of potential magic, a, a whole lot of magic inside of him that he, he still cannot control and due to some things that happen that he basically releases a lot of power to resolve some things, let's say, to not only stop Lisa from attacking the school and her own arc and some other stuff that happened, Yui gets influenced from, let's say, Osmosis to unleash all her power because she's actually the second uh, most powerful mage in the whole school, just second to the headmaster, and she basically starts this whole thing where, uh, according to her own, let's say, her own magic that's based, based on not only dreams, but she basically lives on a dream and sleeps every day all the time and basically she, her own whole power is inside of dreams and whatever. Yui gets every, everyone in the school that has a lesser magic power to sleep and basically not only that but uh, summons nightmares outside of the, in the outside world and whatever so Arata has to rescue her and whatever and through finding his tema, his theme, and his archive, where that is Suburbia, the pride, um, he finds, a, he creates his own like magic spell that erases all of ma all the magic in a given target and whatever. Basically, a, a mass dispel, let's say, and saves Yui, and so the tri whole Trinity Seven is reunited, more or less. Eventually, Lizzie and Selena get together. Liz is still frozen in time, more or less, but uh, Selena discovers a method to basically 
lock um, laser inside her camera and so they can like change bodies more or less um, Selena gives control of her body so Liz can can come out of the, the frozen time inside her body S because Lisa at this point is so much more powerful than Selena and, and is actually a Trinity 7 that will help Arata in future fights and whatever. So from this point on as Yui gets let's say rescued we get to the build up to the last let's say the last arc the, the anime covers that first is the um, altercation and the revelation of what actually is the demon lord inside of Arata. So Arata has a, let's say, a traumatic experience uh, while fighting a rogue grimoire from Hijiri. And he transforms into his demon lord form, let's say. They call that him Astral Trinity. And he's all powerful. He basically releases all the latent power he has and it's a whole whole thing and whatever and Narata gets his second grimoire so the first grimoire he got is from Hijri and, and this is a uh, important detail let's say each of the grimoires has like a book form a object form some of the grimoires are different and a human form so his first one, the Astil Codex, is called Sora, and the, then the second one that he gets after this altercation is another one from Hijiri, although it's not directly given from her. That is the um, Iliad Fragment, or uh, as they eventually call her, just Idia. Because after in the manga, they actually get to know the original Codex and the. the um, original idiot and whatever so a whole lot of stuff happened in the manga but the, the anime unfortunately uh, does not have that luxury so anyways before I, I get even more sidetracked so the the last um, arc that they have is actually the, the let's say the plot twist and the revelation of what actually a demon lord is so Hijiri comes out actually she's a bad girl she's with the bad guys and tries to kill Arata and there's a whole fight and whatever and in the last episode before uh, Hijiri eventually let's say kind of dies in the, the anime the, she reveals actually what what it means to be not only 27 but uh, also the um, demon lord that the demon lord eventually uh, will reunite with the 27 and destroy the world and so after the destruction of the world, a new world's born, and so on and so forth. And this, this is like a cycle, right? And so the anime basically ends with Arata swearing that first he will save Hijiri from her her sitch because her sitch is basically not that she's unrevocably dead, but she's like stuck inside of another rift between dimensions and so on and so forth. The manga really expands on this and a whole lot of stuff also happens but uh, for the sake of the anime for the sake of this this podcast he swears that he will save Hijiri again and that he will control the destiny of the world and not be the one that will destroy the whole world as the, the demon lord and so that's the basically that's Trinity 7 <laughs> all together so now to the to why this fits inside the whole theme of the series and also my opinions about the animation music and so on and so forth so first off the why does this uh, fill in so first off uh, as i already said main protagonist is a normal boy and whatever and finds himself in a, a magical system magical world and whatever is a pervert outright um they take the the comedic timing of the of the jokes uh, involving the, um, let's say, the age nature of this anime a whole lot different than uh, High School DxD, as High School DxD has most of the punchlines coming out to be the the girls losing their clothes and uh, Issei basically uh, coming out clean. Arata for the most part, and and this is a joke that is recurring. They do it a lot and a lot and a lot. Is that he will get punched 
or slapped or beaten with something. But he will reaffirm that the fact that he liked what he saw, and meaning that he's more or less shameless in a different way to Issei from High School TXT, but still on the same vein. Not only that, as I said, the main protagonist, again, a redhead who eventually gets to be the, the son of the devil, something like that. And this one in specific, um, Trinity 7 in specific, has a whole lot of the same vibe as the XD, as they have this intermingling of mythologies. So not only the archives are based on the Seven Deadly Sims, but as the story progresses in the manga, and I think in the movies, they get introduced to more and more um, not only mythological figures from modern mythologies outside from Christianism, and they eventually get to also cross that with literature references. So, for instance, the first major arc that they pass through is the uh, Gates of Dante, so they have to fight the... Uh, Male Blancs, which I, I think I pronounced that wrong, but still, which are the, the, let's say, the main devils, the main servants of the Demon Lord in Hell, and from then on, we get to, oh my god, I, we get to a whole lot of other stuff which crosses the Norse mythology with some of the Japanese mythology, with some more of Christian mythology and so on and so forth. And, and the whole thing is a really... It's a mix-up and whatever. But the vibe is the same. That, that's what I... Not only the vibe is the same with the characters and the, the way that the characters, let's say, act. But also the thematic, the, the aesthetic they, they go for is much alike, much much similar and but yeah outside from that it's a whole lot of different stuff and now i will talk more about twin seven in itself so as i said they although it's pretty similar to high school dxd uh twin seven has a whole lot of different approaches to stuff and one of the main things is the story structure twin seven is First and foremost, a shonen manga with some itch in it. So you can kind of say the itch is more towards the fan service side rather than the the let's say the involved in the story kind of the stuff they, that High School DXD does. But at the same time, the um, High School DXD is less let's say structured in a way of the shonen. Uh, to give a good example, let's talk about one of the the Mark Shonens that I you always use as an example. So let's talk about Bleach for a second. Bleach, for those who never watched it, is structured on the following. So the guy, the main guy, Ichigo, gets powers, then he fights for a bit, finds someone stronger than him, gets beaten, trains, beats that guy, fights out for a bit, finds someone stronger, gets beaten, trains for a bit, beats that guy, and the cycle repeats and repeats until the end of the manga, and the anime for that matter. And I am including the Blood War kind of stuff because I, from what I can remember, I think it's that mostly the same. The, f the thing is, right, the... Um, for instance, the... Um, and I'm not saying this is strictly, strictly true. Turing 7, for the most part, follows in the same um, style. So Arata will get some powers, fight for a bit, gets beaten, gets trained, beats the force, whatever happens. And this cycle will continue until the end, most likely. And, the man and as all the um, shonen that have ever been, let's say, successful, mainly Naruto, One Piece, and so on and so forth, Attack on Titan, whatever. The one thing that 
is always present is the power creep or the power scaling because um, as as the enemies fall the um, the power needs to be greater so the challenge needs to be greater and so the this is the cycle that comes on and repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats to the point that in the manga they straight up exploded the first um power structure let's say so they went way over the archives they went way over the whole thing the the guys who created the themes the the whole the whole thing just went out out of the proportion let's say F to the point that the manga is too interesting to to read and the, the things that happen is too they are still really involved in whatever but uh, unfortunately the anime doesn't actually follow that and sets up a lot but the, the second season may never come and but the the thing is right so as a shonen manga different from high school dxd the the power creep is really generalized and not only that but it is a part of the structure of the plot so much so that you can actually see that happening in the this first season this only season the power creep from one point to another to another to another keeps increasing until the point that arata becomes the demon lord for a bit and then we have the 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 last arc where the anime finishes and this continues in the manga, the, the structure continues on, where the, the High School DxD doesn't actually have that. Uh, that being said, the, both of them are from the same theme, and some people at the time, I remember, and maybe nowadays even, may call uh, High School 37 a more, a more balanced or better High School DxD, because they are really close in thematic and character structure and relations although the the overall arc the overarching let's say plot is quite different and the structure is quite different too so that's the the whole thing about the the theme let's say so talking about animation and music and art so judge for this anime i think it's it follows a lot of the um, the manga, although there there are uh, certainly some adaptations made, I will not say they're bad. They're good adaptations. I think in, in some ways the adaptations they did to some of the characters, that some of the and mainly Yui's dream form, they did an adaptation that the manga shows it. She's much more of an onesan in the dream world in the manga, but. In the anime, they kind of mellow that a bit, which does kind of leave us some questions of whether there is really a difference or not. The, the thing is, right, so I think it's a, an adaptation that is pretty okay, given everything, because most of the people won't ever read the manga, really. Although, I I really think they should. The manga is not bad, it's pretty nice. And it, it is the one shonen that I'm still reading to this day. But the thing is, the um, towards art in its general, I think they did a good work. The the animation though, the animation is a major problem. The um, first episodes they have a chronic problem of really really sketchy frames. The um, you know when the the background characters are really like drawn as first let's say they are really badly drawn at the beginning the towards the end of the season the consistency kind of gets better though some of the parts of the animation i still think they are pretty bad no matter how much they they try to improve to um from the start to the finish of the the season for instance there is this one and i think they actually recycle this this part where there's this frame where they basically just frame like Lilith's legs walking around the the hallway and the hallway has this whole like I don't know if it's granite or whatever a texture like it's like a laminated stone underneath and for some reason it feels really wrong because the 
like the it gives the impression that her feet e are on a different speed from the ground. It, it's really jarring to actually notice it, but I think it's the the worst part. The, um, they then give a shot of her, let's say, upper torso actually walking it, and it's much better than the the first one where there's only her her legs. That being said, the animation is pretty static. As I said, the, the fights are mostly uh, ranged with big uh, particle effects and whatever. But the physical attacks are really not present at all. The, there's no punching each other or that kind of thing. And for the most part, the animation is pretty just serviceable. The, they really focus more on story rather than action in this first season. And for once, the, the manga actually does a better job of having action scenes rather than the anime. So, you know, that's that. Talking about music, the songs for the opening, this song for the opening is really, really, really remarkable. I quite like it, although I don't have the names here. The songs for the opening are quite likable. The ending actually changes from... I think they're, they have three endings in this one season. And for the most of it, the I don't actually know if I'm right saying this, but the, they change the endings according to the, the arcs they are basically representing, the arcs that they are actually showing in the story. And the insert songs are really good. That being said, for my opinion, really, I said in the first episode that the blanket statement is that I don't actually recommend any of the anime I'm talking about here, but I have to at the very least acknowledge that the manga for 27 is pretty nice and I actually recommend it if I'm still doing this when the manga actually finishes, which I don't actually know. <laughs> If they will actually finish it or not, um, I would maybe do a review of the manga, most likely. Although thinking about it, I don't actually have much to say uh, about the manga itself. Though the manga is pretty good, I highly recommend the manga. The, the anime, as I said, it has only one season and two movies. I don't actually know what the movies cover, so... My tendency is to say that they will only cover, at most, the start of the Gates of Dante arc, which is really early in the story, because a whole lot of stuff happens, and oh my god, a whole lot of shit happens. It's really wild later on in the story, and but basically that's it, right? So, so that's about it. So, if you like what I do, if you like the show, if you like the podcast... Uh, please like, please follow, please subscribe, please join the Discord, uh, if you can, share with a friend and whatever, uh, depending on the platform you're in. And also, as a reminder, I think at the point that I published this, it's been like a month, but I will actually plug this in because I, I don't actually have much in the way of, of announcements and ads. There is a... Um, video that I did about Oshinoko in the YouTube channel so I really would want you to watch it and give me feedback because I really like doing it although it took like like one month of my life but whatever um, I really want uh, feedback on it because I want to make more of it later on I don't actually have the time right now but uh, if you can please watch it and give me feedback to the comments and whatever so, and that's about it. I hope you like it. Thank you for listening. I hope you stick around. Bye.